In 1936, my father Björn bought Excelsior in Lovesoft in England. He makes it into a shipping vessel, puts in an engine and starts his period of a coastal skipper along the Norwegian coastline. Before my father bought Excelsior to Norway, Excelsior has been a fishing trawler in Lovesoft. And later, after the Norwegian she came back to Lovestoft and had been a clay vessel. Urban and I had the pleasure to sail with Excelsior. It gave us a feeling we didn't really know, because uh, sailing with a 77 foot long vessel down Kattegat in eight knots without an engine and the noise it makes. Beautiful. In 1954, my father sold Excelsior to Burrowsen, and Eivind is the son of them, and uh, he had been on uh, Excelsior for the first 18 years since he was born in '53, And it's not many minutes has gone before he recognized the movements of the ship, even without an engine. Eivind is steering, and I make the movie. There's a huge force at stake, big heavy sail, but the Excelsior is floating like a seagull, lifting its behind when the sea comes in from the back. When we left Oslo, we got a quiet training in what we didn't already know from the shipping period. For example, pulling out the deer bomb and hoisting the, the big sail. And Karl from Poland is the first mate on board. The capstan winds, the blue one, was found underneath a house in Svinor in 1972 when the ship was sold back to Robosoft. It has been under the house for 40 years. Sarafina from States is volunteering as a crew on board. It's a heavy job to hoist a big sail. One of the main ideas of letting young people sail with the ship is to give them the first hand experience with huge forces on board. We are in for quite a ride. We just don't know it yet. At the start of 1900, there was several hundred sailing trawlers like Excelsior in Lovestoft. In the 60s, there was no one left. They were either sold, burned, or sunken. John, with his crew, found Excelsior in Svinor in 1972. He has spent over 40 years in restoring her and making sure she would function as so she wanted. We were, we were using that unless it was proved otherwise, because uh, that's rye practice, yeah, yeah. and this is lower stock. Yeah. And I showed a, um, an old smacksman, because I think the shipwrights were all dead then, uh, a drawing of this, and I said, is this right for the fair leading post? He said, yeah, it looks about right. As soon as we put it on board, he came over and said, that's wrong, <laughs> and it's wrong, only because in lower stock they, they took the wood up yeah, like that, like like these, mm. you know, that took took the wood over the top. Yeah. Uh, whereas in rye, they, they cut it off. But it's better this one. Hook, hook the stopper in and, uh, and and bend it onto the yeah. rope. Take it off the capstan and and 
uh, put it on that hook because that hook takes the weight to the deck beam yeah. rather than the start mm. the, 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 the ball work. Yeah. When we pass uh, the lighthouse in Dunafrir, everything is still quiet and normal. And we want John to tell us the difference between a Brixton trawler and a Lovestorp trawler. Well, it's because the sea conditions are different. In the Atlantic, coming into the west of, of England, the sea is, the waves are, are very long centres with a, with a sides that are fairly flat. Whereas in the North Sea, the waves are much steeper. So in the West Country, they made the bows fine and the bows would get enough lift um, uh, over there. Whereas in the North Sea, the bows had to be much fuller to, to lift the hulls quicker. Otherwise the sea broke over the bows. So um, there is a significant difference between uh, a Lowestoft smack, whoever built it, and a Brixham smack, which was usually built in Brixham. So just because a smack was built in Brixham doesn't mean it's a Brixham smack. It could have been built for Lowestoft or Grimsby or Hull or... Uh, uh, uh. Yes, this, this vessel has... Uh, I don't think anything's happened since 1983, so I don't think she exists. Um, would, would, it just, would tell us something, huh? and so it's sketched on here, so it's, uh, uh, you know, that's why there are these odd extra scribbles. But uh, let's keep, keep, keep turning. That's a record. These are all the new frames. And these in the middle are the old frames, uh, uh, sort of flattened out. Yeah. And these are the, the, the cant frames, and so on. This is the, the planking record, where, where all the butts in the planks come. And that's been refastened, and the, so it's the, the, the planking, the original, it's just, it's just um, how it is now. Another section, then this is getting into electrical diagrams and the ballast, where the ballast is organised. That's the propeller arrangements now. Dion said propeller, so now we are at the day's challenge. When we pass Oskarsborg Castle, we have to stop the engine. There's some trouble with the shaft. We will of course continue to trip by the sail, but there's a school class waiting for us in Copenhagen in three days. So there's not much time to fix. We cannot sail through the Thiel Canal without an engine and it's difficult enough to dock. Wait and see. Uvin and I will continue in our watches, and the crew is considering alternatives. There's a strong wind building up in uh, when we reach uh, Skagerrak. The ship feels at home in this water. In the old days, she flowed through it like an iron with 100 ton of cement in a cargo hold. Now she's got a bit less to carry, and even I can feel a great power at stake. 
The following day we have taken a turn of towards Bohus Ledkusten in Sweden so that John can get a uh, telephone call to uh, Edgen along the coast. How much will it cost? Do you wonder? Is it the gearbox? We move in the Swedish coastline. Who is a little bit hesitant? We are keeping the shift adrift, the sun is setting. We have to go to Aarhus, John says. Then when I insist, we have to go to Greno instead. Not just because it is easy to come there, but it was in Greno Excelsior got her first in engine installed in 1936, a Greno engine. John uh, shows us where the wheelhouse and the head frame used to be in the old days. This far above the deck, yeah. and then on top of that was the wheelhouse. Yeah. And then uh, from here to the to uh, from here to here, oh, the alarm, the alarm's going. Up. So here to here was a cargo hatch, yeah. and this was a winch yeah. to, to work the, the cargo, and then there was another hatch for it. I better check <laughs> that. Uh, the, the, the steam capstan replaced th three men, and uh, before they had the steam capstan, these vessels only had one mast, but the boom was I enormous, and the, when the crew was reduced after they introduced the steam capstan, there weren't enough men to work the mainsail, so they had to make it smaller and introduce a mizzenmast. And uh, there is a rope going from, from the bottom of the ground rope up over the rail, through, the, through that sheave and onto the capstan, and that pulls the, the belly of the net up, up to the ship, and then they, they lift the end of the trawl with all the fish in it up on deck with one on that mast and one on this mast so it comes up midships and they pull the knot and all the fish go on deck and then they gut them Captain Gavin has ordered out the long ropes and made the ship ready to enter a port none of us have been in before. We don't know how to come, come in, we don't know what we are going to see. The horizon line is waking up, we can see the Danish coast. We are nearby Greno. The gear bomb is pulled in and we will use the sail.
The wind is getting stronger and we see the narrow inlet. <laughs> Because we are not a big crew on this tour, everyone had to do his share. The only steering us, he never has been steering Excelsior before. This is Denmark, the water is yellow. Excelsior touches the bottom when we get too close to the breakwater. John and Irving had to keep the ship up against the breakwater. When we are coming so near, we have only one try to get between the breakwater. At the moment we are on the inside, we lose the wind completely. Get ready for the swings. Tie off the anchor, ready. Another two pounds on it. Is that anchor holding or not? Let's get the sweeps on, guys. The ship heading for the breakwater. Will the anchor hold? It's slipping. The wind is increasing. Carl runs out to get a hold on the dock. He reaches where it's very moment that the anchor lets go. Carl managed to move. We are relieved. We can finally get a look around in Greno Yachting Harbour. 
a Dane later asked me why we wanted to dock here, in the yachting harbour. The government had dredged the harbour the, the day before. Had we gotten two days before, we had been stuck in the inlet. <laughs> For Owen and me, this has been a strong experience. Sailing without an engine. There's a huge difference between flashing the sail and driving a port with an engine. And it was here my father sailed in 80 years ago and drove out with an Grano engine. <laughs> just can you give me two seconds? <laughs> I'll just finish it a bit. <laughs> okay, so this is it. For the people in Lovesoft, Excelsior looks the way she used for 19 years ago, with sail, no wheelhouse or a head frame. And Jon has kept her like this for over 40 years. Even and I can go home with a good feeling.